and thank you for coming tonight. So anyways, i um, really excited to do this kind of cram session, high yield critical care review. Um, yeah, I took my critical care boards twice already, not trying to age me already. So the last time I took it was only about, you know, oh my God, two years ago. So I feel like I'm in the trenches with you folks. And I got to tell you that, um, I know everyone's going to do great, whether you're recertifying or certifying. So what I did was I kind of picked a couple of questions I felt were like those, wow, I mean, are they really going there? And I really want to take some time to break it down because I know when I take my boards, I love to do things that are both practical for getting a good score and to help patient care. So I really wanted to talk about this question. This is a 52 year old gentleman. He returned to the United States after a business assignment in Asia. Okay, where does this coming from? Uh, he was there for half a year. And then he goes to the emergency department with uh -oh, confusion and, and severe back pain. So this combination going to the ED, this can't be good. So the patient's medical history is significant for recurrent uric acid, uh-oh, kidney stones. So let's go back to the first line. If you're getting severe back pain, you have recurrent kidney stones, what are they worried about? Uh, pyelonephritis, pyelonephritis, hydronephrosis. Oh my God. So, and if you're having confusion, like what shock kind of goes with that? Well, any shock, but definitely sepsis. So already this isn't sounding good for this guy. So, and he's had these recurrent stones over the past five years. Around eight months ago, the patient had lithotripsy, probably because the stone was so big to address the obstruction. And that obstruction definitely was associated with hydro. And at that time, he developed uh, urosepsis. So the etiological agent of that episode was Pseudomonas. And it was resistant to, uh-oh, fluoroquinolones. And, you know, let's go back to some basics. So how do fluoroquinolones work? Well, they're protein synthesis inhibitors. Yes, they love to inhibit one of my favorite enzymes out there called DNA gyrase, otherwise known as uh, topoisomerase. And it was also resistant to a third generation cephalosporin. So what third generation cephalosporin covers pseudomonas? And the answer is septazidine, you know, and it's also resistant to miropenem. So if you got a gram negative that's resistant to miropenem, oh boy, God, now you're really worried about a lot of resistance because three letters jump to mind, CRE, carbipenem resistant enterobasiae. And if you're going to be resistant to cephalosporins, oh boy, four letters jump to mind. No, not those four letters, <laughs> but uh, ESBL, extended spectrum beta lactamases. He's not doing good. So patient has been on suppressive antibiotic therapy with ciprofloxacine. And on exam, he appears acutely ill. He's febrile. His blood pressure is low. And they gave him fluid resuscitation. They gave him three liters of lactated ringers. And you know what? He didn't respond. Uh, they do a UA, as you should. There's numerous WBCs, white cell casts. And of course, you always, always want to do a gram stain. to See, you know, what are we playing with? Gram positive, gram negative. And what a surprise, it's gram negative bacteria. Um, based on these epidemiological considerations, what do I mean? Patient was in Asia for half a year. He has resistance to cephalosporins and carbipenems um, for resistant pathogens. And severity of this patient's clinical presentation, uh, confusion, hypotension, what antibiotic would most likely cover all the clinical pathogens for which he is at risk for? So I'm looking at this and I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, is this going to be on my critical care board exams? The answer is uh, yes. And I felt a little blown away too. I'm like, is this even English? I mean, there, what, what do we have here? We have some septolazine, tazobactam. I guess Zosin's familiar. We're on some meropenem, babobactam. We're on some sepdericol. And okay, another one jumps to mind, linezolid. So, you know, I'm looking at these and I'll tell you one thing that for me, the answer doesn't just jump out at me. Which one can I say? I'm probably not going to be worried about as much. It's definitely going to be, I'm not going to pick linezolid. Why? Because that gram stain is always so important. Can you have gram positive bugs in the urine? The answer is definitely. Can you say enterococcus, enterococcus facium or fecalis? And sure, you definitely will have a positive gram stain, but we have gram negative bugs. So I don't think I'll be needing this gram positive coverage. So which one of these is going to be the right answer? And the answer is, you know, I mean, let's talk about it. That's 
you know, the whole point of this question. So to pick the right answer, we really got to go back to the basics. And yes, I did put this slide up there. <laughs> it does say prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So you got to understand what are we and what are bacteria? So everyone, what, what am I? That's right. I'm a eukaryote while bacteria are prokaryotes. So what really separates a eukaryote from prokaryotes is going to be those membrane bound organelles. So prokaryotes don't have any. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have a Golgi apparatus, a mitochondria of any of these things, but we do. And of course, being eukaryotes, what is my, the, the most important? important thing I have inside my cell is going to be the nucleus. And when we talk about the name eukaryote, eu means true and karyote means nucleus, true nucleus. So why am I even bringing this up? Because it really shows why when we take antibiotics, they can kill bacteria and not us. Because prokaryotes are just going to be basically just a bunch of cytoplasm. So when we talk about the dogma of how antibiotics work, well, when we talk about humans or bacteria or viruses, it really comes down to DNA can replicate, DNA can undergo transcription where we make, you know, things like messenger RNA, which is a temporary copy of the DNA. And you can undergo translation where you take that messenger RNA and you can make protein. So these are gonna be ways that antibiotics are going to be working. So when we talk about that RNA here, I know I just put the word RNA here, remember, there are three types of RNA, and this is why it's going to be very important. I'm, I'm mentioning this. We mentioned messenger RNA, just that temporary copy, but ribosomal RNA, when we talk about bacteria, you can just imagine huge cytoplasm with tons and tons and tons of ribosomes just in that cytoplasm. And of course, you know, when you want to make that protein, these transfer RNAs bring in amino acids to make that protein. So when we talk about these prokaryotes, this is gonna be a nice picture over here that you're gonna see lots and lots and lots of what? Cytoplasm and all these little dots here, tons and tons of dots are gonna be what? Ribosomes. And we're gonna break down you know, the structure of the bacteria when we talk about cell wall and cell membrane in one moment. But I really wanted to show you how many ribosomes are just hanging out in the cytoplasm and there are no membrane bound organelles. All you have in the cytoplasm is what? The DNA right there. So when we talk about these, you know, prokaryotes, bacteria, and I said ribosomes are gonna be the ones that are gonna be translating that messenger RNA, that in prokaryotes, of course, we have what's called the 70S uh, unit. It's made up of the 50S, the big one, which really brings in the transfer RNA and the small one, which actually is gonna take the messenger RNA and make the protein. So with that being said, now that you understand the beginning, why is the gram stain so important on any board exam, including the critical care boards? Because it's really gonna tell you, number one, what are we trying to cover? And number two, it really makes you appreciate the word resistance. So when we talk about the critical care boards, what are the hottest topics in critical care now are resistant gram negative bacteria. That's a huge thing right now. So when we talk about in general, I mean, why is there a lot more resistance when we talk about gram negatives versus gram positives is it really comes down to the basics. It really comes down to, I mean, what makes a gram negative negative and positive positive? And it's more than just the gram stain, of course, I mean, if you're gram positive, you're gonna have a little purple color to it. If you're gram negative, you're gonna be kind of like that pinkish red, but it really comes down to the cell wall. So when you tell me what is probably one of the most common categories of antibiotics that we use for bacteria, it's gotta be beta-lactam drugs. And so when we talk about beta-lactam drugs, I mean, let's list a couple of them, penicillins, cephalosporins, carbipenems, you know, and what are they attacking is the cell wall. So when we talk about gram-positive bacteria, look at their cell wall. It's in yellow here. It's huge. You have a huge target for these antibiotic categories, these beta-lactams. Well, when we talk about gram-negatives, the cell wall itself is actually really small, very small target. Now, on top of that, when we talk about bacteria, gram-positives or negatives, what's going to be above and below the cell wall is called the cell membrane. So people always ask me, what's the difference between a membrane and a wall? Well, the cell membrane is semi-permeable, but the cell wall is pretty impermeable. So look at this gram negative that's going to be on the right. you got that cell membrane above and below the cell wall. And what is this layer up here? It's called a capsule. So gram positives and gram negatives could have capsules, but look at 
all the defenses a gram negative has just to begin with. So, you know, I know when we talk about capsules, we always, I know back in US Assembly step one days, there were little mnemonics we remember of who has capsules and who don't. I think that uh, Klebsiella has a capsule, Strep Pneumo has a capsule, Neisseria has a capsule. There's all these different ways we kind of remember this. But with this being said, what are we talking about today? Gram negatives. So now we know what really separates gram negatives from gram positives. So when we talk about the two main categories of antibiotics you need to know for the critical care boards, I put them in stuff that attacks the cell wall. So they're gonna be these beta lactams, we said penicillins, cephalosporins, and carbipenems. But what other antibiotics can also attack the cell wall? Of course, vancomycin and something called azotrianam. We don't use it that common. It's a monobactam we use for people who are somewhat penicillin allergic. And then the other way is gonna call bacterial protein synthesis inhibitors. And that's where we went back to that initial dogma right here, where we said, hey, don't forget this, that's how our antibiotics are gonna work. So when we talk about what's gonna inhibit bacterial protein synthesis, especially when we focus on gram negatives, think about aminoglycosides, but we don't really use them. Why? It's because number one, toxicities. And who can tell me the two toxicities of aminoglycosides, things like gentamicin and amikacin and tobramycin. Yeah, of course, renal toxicity and ototoxicity. You know, and then of course there's macrolides or tetracyclines. Please God, no one pick chloramphenicol for your boards. <laughs> That's always the wrong answer. And, and of course, our gram positive coverage, lindeslid, these are gonna inhibit bacterial protein synthesis. So one thing I wanted to mention, which is gonna be great for the board exams is, well, how do, bacteria get resistance. So if you're gonna be a gram positive, usually when we talk about beta lactam drugs, they, we, uh, gram positives get resistance because of mutating the penicillin binding proteins. So all beta lactams, whether they're cephalosporins or carbipenems, they bind to these penicillin binding proteins. And from there, they can damage the cell wall. Um, gram negatives, However, they usually get resistance by making what they call beta-lactamases. So by making these beta-lactamases, they break down the beta-lactams. So gram negatives, like the question we're talking about now, are probably gonna have resistance because of they have these beta-lactamases. So when we talk about beta-lactamase inhibitors, so all those drugs you, you saw over there had, most of them had a core drug attached to a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So the classic ones are things like tazobactam, clavonic acid, sublactam, and these are kind of like what we refer to as suicide substrates, meaning that they're attached to an antibiotic, and what happens is the bacteria destroys the tazobactam, the clavonic acid, the sublactam, and the core drug does the killing. So it's like a suicide substrate. But there are newer generations of these beta-lactamase inhibitors, Avibactam, Relbactam, Vabobactam, and they don't even contain a beta-lactam ring. So we kind of call them these non-beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors. And when they are, when they do their killing, it's irreversible. And because it's irreversible, they got FDA approval for really resistant gram-negative bugs, such as ESBL and CRE, just to mention that. So why am I even talking about this? I'm sure someone listening today is like, oh my God, what is this slide? But it's getting confusing. So rounds in the ICU, what's a Fetrosia? What's a Vabamir? What's a Zerbaxa? What's a Bercarbia? Like what happened to the olden days? Where's my Cephapeme and Augmentin? <laughs> so there are so many combinations out there. And what are these new drugs for? Resistant gram negative bugs. So that's why I put this question here. So on top of this, being confusing, um, there's a lot of overlap. And what is the niche? So even when we talk about the drugs in this question, things like Vabamir or Zerbaxa, that sure, they definitely have their niche and we're gonna talk about that, but there's a lot of overlap. So, you know, Avacaz can have a little pseudomonal coverage, but same as Cervaxa. Can Cervaxa cover some ESBL? It does, but it's not really an ESBL drug. So because of all these things, it's very confusing. And now there's questions like this, like this on the boards. So to really appreciate these drugs and how do we get here, we really have to go back and just kind of go to the basics and see how we kind of progressed. So when we talk about beta-lactams, I mean, it really comes down to the penicillin story. So when we talk about penicillin, um, number one, 
uh, the year is the 1940s. And in the 1940s, there was a very famous world war. I mean, who could tell me what world war was in the 1940s? That's right. It was World War II. And during that war, there was really bad infections. A lot of bad skin infections. And when you have a lot of skin infections, of course, you were about grandpa's bugs. So, of course, penicillin that was discovered by Alexander Fleming, um, you know, was one of the main drugs that we were using at the time. And we had our penicillin. Of course, the minute we started using it, we get what? Resistance. And how did they gain resistance? They're modifying that penicillin binding protein. So we came up with semi-synthetic penicillin, things like oxacillin or nafacillin. And of course, what happened was there was something called a mech a gene that was one of the mutations and it gave us MRSA. Uh-oh. But all this was for gram positive coverage. But we wanted to have some gram negative coverage. So we came up with the amino penicillins, things like ampicillin, things like amoxicillin. But those are only gram negative easy bugs. So what is a gram negative easy bug? Will be something like E. coli, you know? But we wanted to go to those gram negative difficult bugs, you know? And what's that difficult gram negative we worry about? Pseudomonas. So what did we come up with? Extended spectrum penicillins. And the classic one out there is pepercillin. But what do we know, everyone, when we talk about gram negatives? How did they get their resistance? Yeah, through these beta lactamases. So we wanted to come up with beta lactamase inhibitors so our gram negative, you know, core drugs could be have more oomph to them when they want to combat things like pseudomonas. So we came up with all these first generation beta lactamase inhibitors. Flavonic acid, sublactam, and of course, tazobactam. And we took the pepercillin, combined it with tazobactam, and we got zosin. And we definitely know zosin, broad spectrum antibiotic, that definitely covers what? Pseudomonas. But of course, we weren't happy just having penicillins out there. You know, we came up with cephalosporins, which is another beta lactam drug. So, when we talk about cephalosporins, you know, it all comes down to these generations, you know, and it's kind of confusing sometimes because you got to memorize a lot. But I think most of us agree that when we talk about cephalosporins, the earlier generations give you more gram positive. And as you go up in the generations, you get a little more gram, well, a lot more gram negative. <laughs> so, you know, we have our first generation cephalosporins, things like Keflex, things like uh, Ancef. And then we went to our second generations. One of them that jumps to mind is cephotetan. Why? Because it had a little, you know, uh, anaerobic coverage. And then we went to our third generations, and that's when we got our first anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin, which I mentioned already was what? Ceftazidine. Of course, we have ceftriaxone, our workhorse for community-acquired pneumonias. Then we went over to the fourth generations, and I'm sure many people listening today have their workhorse in their ICU, which is what? Cefepine. That definitely covers what? Pseudomonas. Now we have two anti-pseudomonal uh, cephalosporins. But the story doesn't stop there. There's actually fifth generation cephalosporins and the two of them that jump out at me, one is called ceftaroline, which really kind of is more niche to MRSA, but the other one is ceftolazane. And not only does ceftolazane cover pseudomonas, it got combined with tazobactam and now we have the brand name Cervaxa and it's a Really, really good drug when we talk about, you know, um, killing, addressing pseudomonas. So with that being said, let's take it to the gram-negative bug and, well, how do you get resistance? So this is going to be a more detailed view of a gram-negative bug right here, bacteria. And you can see the cell wall in the beginning, in the middle, the cell membrane above and below. And when we talk about how do gram-negative bugs get resistance, there are three main ways three main ways. Number one, it's going to be poor in mutations. So when we talk about these pores, these are going to be like these channels where simple diffusion can occur and these red dots are antibiotics. So if you have a lot of pores, porins, then your antibiotics get to go inside the cytoplasm. And look at this, there's nothing in there but what? Just ribosomes. So you antibiotics, they come in. So what do bacteria do? Gram-negative bacteria, they have mutations to lose the porin, so antibiotics can't get in. What's the second way you can do it? Right here, there's beta lactamases, and it's right there in that cell wall. So when a beta lactam drug comes in, these beta lactamases destroy the drug. What's the third way we can do that? 
is going to be these efflux pumps, the third way you can get resistance. So what do these pumps do? Just like it says, E stands for exit. So when the antibiotic is in, these efflux pumps will pump out all the antibiotic. So how do bacteria develop resistance? They have overexpression of these efflux pumps. So immediately when the antibiotic comes in, it gets pumped out. So when we talk about, you know, what's going to be a great medication antibiotic for a gram negative, you want to address a lot of these. So when we talk about terminology, like in this uh, vignette, ESBL, CRE, what do these things mean? So ESBL stands for extended spectrum beta lactamases. And really to kind of simplify it for the boards and clinical, it just means you're really resistant to what? Cephalosporins. When we talk about carbapenem resistant in Terabasiae, that's going to be CRE. Well, there are different two main ways to get CRE as far as genetics. You know, one of the main ways is you have KPCs. That sounds to Klebsiella pneumoniae carbapenemase. And that's about almost 90 plus percent here in the States. But if you go overseas or say in Asia, the way they have it will be through these things called the metalloproteinases, something that we refer to as the New Delhi strain. But in the United States, we definitely worry about KPCs, which is how they get res this uh, carbapenemin, carbapenem re resistant in Terabasiae. So the last thing I want to mention is this thing's called plasmids. Now, just to mention, when we talk about plasmid, that it's an area that contains DNA separate of the main DNA of the bacteria. And this DNA can actually be uh, translated into protein. And these plasmids, you know, in gram negatives such as Pseudomonas, can definitely uh, have you cause another mutation called the AMP-C mutation, which is how Pseudomonas gets their beta-lactamases. So as I mentioned already, CRE, largely because of these KPC producers. I mentioned already that in the US, greater than 90% of people have CRE as secondary to KPCs. And when we I wanted to mention, so if you have someone that has ESBL or KPCs, well, why are we only focusing on, you know, beta-lactam medications? Well, there are other medications we can use, and let me just mention it, aminoglycosides, you know what I mean, or polymyxins. And do we commonly use those drugs in the ICU? Are those the right answer on the boards? Probably not, and the main reason is why toxicity. So there are other options there, but they have so many toxicities. We don't use polymyxins. We don't use aminoglycosides when we talk about these gram-negative uh, bacteria. So really, after all this, what does it really come down to so you get the right answer on the boards? So when we talk about what are the answer choices, what is septolazine, tazobactam, zerbaxia? It got the FDA approval for pseudomonas. It's a great anti-pseudomonal drug. It works on what? The porn mutations, the efflux pumps, the beta-lactamases, and it got FDA approval for pseudomonas in the urine, abdomen, and lung. Now, when we talk about meropenem uh, vabobactam, vabomir, which was one of the other choices there, it actually got the FDA approval for CRE, secondary to KPCs. Doesn't make, doesn't surprise me because that's the majority of what we see for CRE in the US. And it got the FDA approval for UTIs and pyelonephritis, but when you read the labeling, but not for pseudomonas, but not for pseudomonas. And we'll talk about that in one second. Then we have Another thing that I put it here because many people ask me about this, something called ceftazidine, which is a third generation cephalosporin that already covers pseudomonas combined with avibactam, and we call that Avacast. And this got the FDA approval for ESBL and CRE of the urine, abdomen, and lung. It definitely covers pseudomonas, but probably not going to be the big gun pseudomonas compared to Cervaxa. So it really comes down to Cervaxa, pseudomonas, Nabomir. CRE in the urine, not secondary to Pseudomonas. And Abacaz, you definitely could think about it for CRE and ESBL. And it does have a little overlap with everything, including Pseudomonas. So back to the question, there was a question there. So in this person that came in, we're not gonna read the question again, has all these risk factors, what is the right answer? And I wish I could just look at you, I wish you could just send me the right answer, but the right answer is going to be what? Yeah, 
hysterical call. It's going to be D. So let's work, uh, talk about why it's not going to be the other ones. And let's talk about why uh, septerical is going to be the correct answer. So when we talk about Zosin right off the bat, let me just kind of break this down before we go to my teaching slides. Now, Zosin is not going to be the drug of choice for ESBL. It's not going to be the drug of choice for CRE. So it's going to be the wrong answer. Um, Zerbaxa definitely covers Pseudomonas extremely well, but Zerbaxa is not FDA approved for, you know, CRE, which is what we're worried about here because this patient was meropenem resistant. So already taken off. Meropenem and uh, Vabrobactam, well, definitely covers CRE, but it covers CRE secondary to what? KPCs. Definitely doesn't cover CRE secondary to things that you can get in Asia, like what? That New Delhi strain. And that's where the epidemiology kicked in. Also, this patient already grew Pseudomonas. And what did I say? That Vabomir, when it got the FDA approval for uh, gram negatives in the urine, it really covers uh, E. coli, Klebsiella, but doesn't cover what? Pseudomonas. And it's weird because everyone's going to say, Miropenem covers Pseudomonas, and it really does. And it just so happened that Vabobactam didn't make Miropenem a better anti-pseudomonal uh, antibiotic, so it just didn't get approval for Pseudomonas when we talk about um, in the urine. So not going to be C. E is going to be the wrong answer. We're not talking about gram positive. So by process of elimination, what is this cephtericol? So <laughs> let's talk about that. So I already mentioned why, uh, what do we think about in this patient who has this complicated obstructive uropathy. So of course, you, you definitely want to, you know, address the hydrolymphosis, address the stone, address the obstruction. And you know, this, uh, you want to choose an antimicrobial that really can have addressed many of these resistant mechanisms that we talked about already. So when we talk about beta-lactams, I mentioned already that they will all bind to these penicillin binding proteins. But what are some things that happen first is that they get to go through these porins. They mentioned many of these gram negatives could have these porin mutations, less pores, less can the bacteria here in the right, these red dots can freely diffuse in. So when we talk about these pores where bacteria can diffuse in, I wanted to mention that there is another type of entry system in bacterial cell walls that's somewhat similar to these porins. It's an iron transport system. And yes, bacteria need iron. So when we talk about, and why do they need iron? To grow and everything. So what happens is that there are these iron transport systems that use, you know, more of an, an active transport and bacteria actually secretes these compounds called siderospores. Bacteria naturally do that. What is what does the citrospores do? They chelate all the iron out there and bring it back in to the bacteria. So what it would cephtericol do is that it kind of mimicked, uh, it takes a cephalosporin and attached it to something that mimics these citrospores. So what happens is, is that cephtericol is going to be the cephalosporin antibiotic. It's attached to this kind of iron binding citrospore like moiety. It will bind all the iron. And what does the bacteria want to do is bring it inside. But of course, what's attached to this iron binding, you know, site is the antibiotic, cephtera called the cephalosporin. So they call this kind of like a, a Trojan horse <laughs> effect to do the killing. So when we talk about cephtera call, you know, it actually is very stable in the presence of beta lactamases, including KPCs in the New Delhi strain, when we talk about CRE, um, it definitely can, uh, is good for ESBL. It definitely covers pseudomonas. So of the choices here, based on what we're talking about, the best drug for this patient right here was cephtericol. And as I mentioned already, why um, Zerbaxa wasn't the answer was because of the fact that um, Zerbaxa does not cover CRE. Why do we use of Vomir is the fact that we're thinking about Pseudomonas and the New Delhi strain because they're in Asia and you're not going to get coverage over there. So this was actually one of the questions or a variation of it that definitely will appear on your board exams 
And as you can tell, I really wanted to spend a big chunk of time talking about this because I don't know about you, but it gets really confusing when we talk about all these newer, you know, beta lactam, beta lactamase combination drugs out there for those resistant gram negative bugs. So let's move on to the next question. And I hope you guys really enjoyed that. I really went out of my way to try to make you a, a condensed presentation of that really, really confusing topic. So we have a 26 year old woman is evaluated for muscle weakness developing over the past several months. She has no focal symptoms and states that she's, she otherwise feels well. Medical history is unremarkable and there is no pertinent family history. She takes no meds. On exam, BP is on the lower side, heart rate of 98, respiratory rate of 16, and BMI is 19. There is no lower extremity edema, and the remainder of the examination is unremarkable. All right, so they gave us some serum electrolytes, they gave us some urine electrolytes, and I gotta tell you, on your boards, if they give you some urine electrolytes, you know they gotta be important, because all of us, we love the serum, but the minute we start talking about urine stuff, I don't know, normal values get a little iffy, and it, everyone gets a little kind of panicky, but let's see what the question is. So in this case, um, sodium looks great, potassium on the lower side, and that kind of relates to, you know, in this patient, muscle weakness, you know, hypokalemia. Um, quite a little bit elevated, but look at that bicarb. That bicarb is definitely what? Low. So just looking at the serum electrolytes, patient per se probably has a metabolic, that's right, acidosis. And, you know, you know and I know, anytime you have a metabolic acidosis, what is the next best thing to calculate to categorize your differential diagnosis? Yeah. You got it, the anion gap, and you definitely have enough to calculate the gap. So does this patient have a, um, a anion gap metabolic acidosis? 142 minus 120 minus 15, the answer is no, not even close. So there's a non-gap metabolic acidosis, and there's some urine electrolytes. We got some sodium, potassium chloride, the urine pH, and they did a dipstick, and for what it's worth, there was no protein that was noted there, and no blood. So what is the question? Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's acid base and electrolyte abnormalities? So once again, what did this patient have, everyone? Yeah, uh, a non-GAP metabolic acidosis. And there are a lot of choices over here. So let's kind of go th through these and kind of pick it together. So is bulimia nervosa going to be the right answer, everyone? You know, I would say no, based on the nervosa part. What does nervosa mean clinically? Patients are probably doing a lot of what? Yeah, vomiting, and it's a horrible disease. I wish it on no one. But if you're doing a lot of vomiting, everyone, what type of um, acid-base abnormality do you think you might get? Yeah, 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 I agree. You'll probably get a metabolic alkalosis. So that bicarb is gonna be a, a lot on the higher side. So I wouldn't pick that. Uh, oh my, what is this? Gittleman syndrome? Yeah, I went there. I'm sorry. So there's Barter syndrome and Gittleman syndrome. Oh boy. And if you have some of these syndromes, they're rare, but what type of acid based abnormality would you probably get? You know, and I believe a Gittleman syndrome is like being on lots and lots of what? Thiazide diuretics. So if you're on lots of diuresis, you're diuresing all the time, you'll probably develop a metabolic. Yeah, alkalosis, I agree. So it doesn't really fit there. You know what I mean? Um, laxative abuse, that's going to be a lot of diarrhea. Yeah, you know, I, I could buy that. That'll give you a metabolic acidosis. Um, using a lot of diuretics, that sounds very similar to one of these Barter's or Gittleman syndrome. So if that occurs, you'll probably develop a metabolic yeah, alkalosis. And E, RTA, renal tubular acidosis, well, sure, you'll definitely have a non-GAP metabolic acidosis then. So it really comes down to if I'm in a hurry, and this is the question on the boards, is it going to be C or E? So, hey, everyone, how are you going to decide what's going to be the right answer for the critical care boards? Well, you know what we didn't really look at too much is the urine electrolytes. And when you have a non-GAP metabolic acidosis, why do they put this question here is because on the boards, you know, the test writers know you folks are amazing when it comes to anion gap metabolic acidosis. Everyone has some kind of 
acronym, some kind of mud piles out there that they use to say methanol and ethanol and DKA and lactic acidosis. So, you know, you, I think that's going to be one of, they, they will ask you one, but they really want to squeeze in one of those non-gaps in there so you can figure out what's the next step. So the next step to figure out what's going to be the broad differential for a non-gap metabolic acidosis is calculating the urine anion gap. So how do you do that? Well, it's going to be the sodium plus the potassium minus the chloride of all things. So if I take the sodium plus the potassium, that looks like it's going to be 26 minus the chloride, which is 32. Well, I'm really not going to hyper-focus on the number. I really just want to know if the urine anion gap is going to be one of two things. Is it either going to be positive or is it going to be negative? And so if it's going to be negative, well, it pretty much tells me that the kidneys are working well and they're doing its job. So the problem is probably going to be some kind of GI source. Well, if the urine anion gap is going to be positive, it kind of tells me the kidneys are just not doing its job. Maybe they're a little damaged. So it's probably going to be a kidney problem. And what kidney problem jumps to mind? It's probably going to be some of these RTAs. So when we talk about this urine anion gap, it's negative. So by default, the answer here is going to be what? C. But why did I put this here? I think m many of you got this correct. I really wanted to talk about, hey, why are we talking about the urine anion gap? Or when are we talking about this chloride? So remember, when we talk about metabolic acidosis, of course, you know, we want to actually, compensation is going to occur. Of course, our lungs are definitely going to do a respiratory alkalosis, but the kidneys itself want to correct it. And how can the kidneys correct the metabolic acidosis? Well, they can do it in two ways. Number one, the proximal tubule, that's where you do a lot of reabsorption. And trust me, what are you going to want to reabsorb in the proximal tubule? Bicarb, because you have a metabolic what? Acidosis. But another way to like, you know, help balance things out is going to be in the distal tubule. And when we talk about the distal tubule and how, what is the kidney going to do is they're probably going to be dumping out hydrogen ion. And when we talk about dumping out hydrogen ion in the distal tubule, well, there are two ways we could dump out hydrogen ion. We could do it through what we call these titratable and non-titratable acids. And the most common is going to be these non-titratable. The most common of these non-titratable acids is ammonia. So ammonia is NH3. It combined with hydrogen ion to make ammonium, which is NH4. And that ammonium gets dumped where? In the urine, if the kidneys are doing their job. Now, let me ask you this, everyone. Who has actually ordered a urine ammonium level? The answer is, I haven't. I don't know if you have, but it's just not very common. So we can't really use urine ammonium to figure out the etiology of this non-GAP metabolic acidosis. So instead, we use urine chloride. So why urine chloride is because, you know, urine ammonium, NH4, has a positive charge to it. So something needs to bind to it when it gets dumped in the urine. So urine chloride is part of those urine electrolytes, so very commonly ordered. So it's kind of a surrogate marker for urine ammonium. So let's play the game. Someone comes in and they have lots and lots and lots of diarrhea. They have a non-GAP metabolic acidosis. What is the kidney going to do if they're functioning properly? They're going to start dumping out, you know, ammonium, and therefore chloride will be bound to the ammonium. You're going to have a lot of chloride in the urine. So when you do the formula for the urine anion gap, urine sodium plus a urine potassium minus a huge urine chloride, the urine anion gap is going to be what? Negative. So it means that the GI tract is probably the etiology. And of course, we always could say when the urine anion gap is neg gut <laughs> tiv, always think about GI tract diarrhea. And of course, on the other side of things, you know, if the urine anion gap is positive, well, you think about RTAs. And of course, RTAs are always going to be such a headache because how many RTAs are there? There's three. The first one is what? Type one, which is distal, which makes no sense. Type two is what? Proximal. There's no type three. Then there's type four, which has nothing to do with the tubule. It deals with the hormone. Which hormone is that? Aldosterone. <laughs> so it does get a little confusing there, but I think it's important to know what's the role of the urine anion gap in these cases. So I put the formula here just one more time, and we went through 
all the reasoning why uh, we use the urine chloride as a surrogate marker for urine ammonium. So we have a 23-year-old woman is evaluated in the ED for generalized weakness and lightheadedness for four hours duration. She had no previous contact with the healthcare system and takes no meds. On exam, her blood pressure is 120 over 80 supine, sitting it's 105 over 70. Um, so maybe a little orthostatic. Heart rate is 95 supine, increases to 108 upon standing. BMI is 26. Skin turgor is poor, and there are multiple dental caries are present. There is no JVD. Cardiac exam reveals a regular rhythm with no murmurs. Lung exam is clear. Bowel sounds are hyperactive, and the abdomen is soft, non-tender, and non-distended. Uh oh, I'm not worried about the serum electrolytes here. I'm worried about what? <laughs> More urine electrolytes. So where's the answer going to be? Probably in the urine. So let's look at the, the serum electrolytes. We have a normal sodium. Boy, that potassium is low. Um, chloride is normal. And look at the bicarb. The last question, the patient had a low bicarb. That was a metabolic acidosis. So now we have an elevated bicarb. So you know what I wanted to do for everyone? I want to talk about the complete opposite, which is a metabolic alkalosis. And then we have a bunch of urine electrolytes here. We have a sodium. I put that on the higher side. Potassium is high. And the chloride is low when the urine pH is 7.0. So gave the values of whether they're high or low when we talk about the urine electrolytes. So with that being said, what is the question? Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's hypokalemia. All right. So we got some choices here. Let's kind of go through these together. Um, barter syndrome. I know our last one was Gittleman's. So barter syndrome is kind of like being on continuous loop diuretic. And if you're on continuous loop diuretic, well, trust me, you're going to get a metabolic, yeah, alkalosis. So not a bad, you know, answer here. And I think barter syndrome works on the loop, just like Lasix, the ascending thick limb of the loop of Henle. And I remember that Lasix furosemide works on what? The sodium potassium chloride pump. So you will be dumping out lots of potassium. So I don't know, maybe. Um, could it be diarrhea? Well, not really. If you're having lots of diarrhea, you have a metabolic acidosis. So that really wouldn't fit with the bicarb being 36. Um, RTA, once again, you know what I mean? Uh, it's a acidosis in choice C, this patient's alkalemic, or vomiting, you know? So if you're having a lot of vomiting, sure, you definitely can develop a metabolic alkalosis, but which one of these is gonna be the correct answer? So I look at here and you know what? It's gonna be the deal breaker. It's gonna be the what? Yeah, it's gonna be the urine electrolytes. And when someone comes in and they have a metabolic alkalosis, there are two urine electrolytes that really help you decide what the right answer is clinically and on board exams. And that's gonna be the urine sodium and the urine chloride, urine sodium and the urine chloride. So when we talk about you know a patient like this, well, it looks like the urine sodium is going to be high and it looks like the urine chloride is going to be low. So which one of these is going to fit that? Is it going to be the barter syndrome? Or is it going to be someone who's having lots of vomiting? Hmm. So, I mean, I really wish we could just yell out what the right answer is going to be. So if someone's going to be vomiting, you know, what do you think the urine sodium is going to be? And I already kind of predicted, I think many of you are typing in and screaming and yelling, urine sodium is going to be low because the patient's dehydrated and they need to retain that sodium. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I definitely hear you out there, but in acute vomiting, especially within the first, you know, you know, one to two days, urine sodium is actually going to be on the higher side. Go figure. And we'll talk about that in one second. And the urine chloride is going to be low, but we already said if you have a barter syndrome, you're dumping chloride all the time because what's the pump that's going to be damaging? The sodium potassium chloride pump. So by default, the answer has to be what? Vomiting. Then you look at 
multiple dental caries and all these things put in there. So it really does fit that clinically. So why do I put this question here is because on your board exams, critical care boards, what are they going to try to sneak in? Number one, a non-GAP metabolic acidosis. Number two, a metabolic alkalosis. So I really wanted to spend some time in how do you work up a metabolic alkalosis for the board exams. So when we talk about a metabolic alkalosis, um, a couple of things jump to mind. Well, I want to organize my thought process and put them into categories. So I really look at three things. I know it says two. One is going to be blood pressure. Two says extracellular volume status. But remember, our extracellular volume is going to include two things. Number one is the intravascular volume. And the other one is going to be the volume in the third space. So third space and intravascular together make up extracellular. So I'm really looking at three things here. So when we do the workup for metabolic alkalosis, I look at these three things and I put them into three categories. Number one is going to be individuals that have a low intravascular volume. So inside the vessel, it's kind of low. But when you do a physical exam, they have increased volume in the third space. So they could be edematous, you mean lower extremity edema. So anytime you have edema, you know, fluid in the third space, well, the main problem is it's got to be a hydrostatic problem or an oncotic problem. And really three organs jump to mind when I think about this. Could it be the heart, like CHF, could they be a cirrhotic or nephrotic? That's how you get volume in the third space, through hydrostatic and oncotic problems. And when you look at these patients' blood pressure, it tends to be on the normal to lower side. So when I think about that constellation of findings, what really jumps to mind? Well, I mentioned it to you already. Heart, liver, and the kidney. Nephrotic, cirrhotic, CHF. And <clears throat> when we talk about, you know, someone, why would someone with really, really bad, and let's use the most common thing on your boards, CHF, get a metabolic alkalosis, you can imagine, depending on how bad that left ventricle is, how bad that cardiac output is, how low that EF is, that, you know, all that fluid's going to be where? In the third space. They're going to be intravascularly what? Deplete. They're almost, you know, as if they're like, you know, de dehydrated. So what's going to happen is that when um, it, because they're so contracted is that they're going to rev up because of the decreased volume going to the kidney. They're going to activate an enzyme called renin that activates angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 that eventually activates what? Aldosterone. And when we talk about aldosterone, what does aldosterone do? Sure, it can bring back some sodium, don't get me wrong, but it really dumps out two things. What two things can you dump out? Number one, potassium. Number two, hydrogen ion. When you start dumping out hydrogen ion, you develop a what? Metabolic alkalosis. And really, when do we notice this, everyone? Someone comes in on the boards, they have CHF. And of course, what do you want to do? Reduce the preload. How do you reduce the preload? You give them what? Loop diuretics. And uh-oh, remember all their volumes where to begin with? Third space. So now when you give loop diuretic, as you should, you're really contracting the vessel. You're really revving up that renin angiotensin system. And really, the next day when you check the serum bicarb, it may go from a bicarb of 24 up to 31 because you develop that contraction alkalosis. So if you want to confirm this, you can check your urine sodium, urine chloride. And remember, not when you're actively giving Lasix, but what's going to happen in the aftermath is that it's almost like they're just dehydrated. So urine sodium is going to be low because the body wants to retain that sodium. And remember, sodium can't come back to the body by itself. It wants to come back neutral. Who does it bring back? Chloride. So low urine sodium, low urine chloride. Now, the second category is intravascular volume is going to be low. There's a normal third space. So no problem with hydrostatic or oncotic pressures, but the blood pressure is on the normal to the lower side. So what really jumps to mind here are two types of clinical categories. Number one, that it could be someone who's what? Vomiting. That was this question over here. Or it could be someone who has one of these rare syndromes, that Barter or Gittleman syndrome. And that's why I put this question here. This is a classic question you will get in your board exams 
because it's a little tricky to figure out what is the cause and what is the etiology. So when we talk about someone who's vomiting, what are we going to check? Urine sodium and urine chloride. So why was the urine sodium going to be on the higher side when we talk about vomiting? That's what everyone wants me to talk about. <clears throat> and the answer is, is that because you're vomiting and you have a metabolic what? Alkalosis, that's where we start up here, that the most important thing is your body, your kidney wants to address the metabolic alkalosis. It wants to bring the pH what? Down. How does it do that? Well, there's a very, very special pump in the proximal tubule. And what is this pump? It's the going to be the sodium hydrogen pump. Sodium hydrogen pump. They're both positive charges, so they can't go the same way. They're going to go opposite ways. So what happens when you have a metabolic alkalosis? You retain the sodium. So sodium stays in, which makes sense. And you dump out the the uh, you bring back the hydrogen ion, excuse me, you bring back the hydrogen ion, and you dump out what? The sodium. The sodium gets dumped out into the tubule. And that positively charged sodium wants to bind, guess with who? Bicarb. Because it's pump because it's negative. And if you have a metabolic alkalosis, do you want to dump out bicarb in the urine? Definitely. And because of that sodium hydrogen pump, and you're retaining the so the hydrogen ion and you're dumping out the sodium. The urine sodium is going to be what? High. That's right. And that's where that very high urine sodium comes from. And this happens acutely. This happens acutely. We're not talking about chronic vomiting for weeks and weeks. We're talking about the first few days. But remember, why is the urine chloride going to be low? Is that overall, I mean, you're definitely volume down. You're volume down. So even though you want to bring back some, some sodium, you're still dumping a lot of sodium in there, but when you bring back whatever sodium you can, guess who comes back with it? Chloride. So the chloride in the urine is going to be what? Low. And that's where the low urine chloride came from. So this is going to be a classic question on your board exams versus when we talk about these rare things like Barter's and Gittleman's. Number one, that's never a good answer on the board. Number two, that I mentioned that Gittleman's is like beyond thiazides. Thiazides work on the sodium chloride pump. So you're dumping out sodium and chloride. They're both going to be high in the urine. Um, Barter's is like being on Lasix. So it's going to have working on the sodium chloride and potassium pump. So in the urine, high sodium, high chloride, and high potassium. Good. And last but not least, I'm just going to kind of just to be complete, you know, someone comes in, their intravascular volume is normal maybe slightly high normal to high normal to high third space is totally normal but what's going to be the big deal breaker is the blood pressure and you could circle this a bunch of times they're going to have a super super duper high blood pressure and what do they have metabolic alkalosis so if you kind of have this phenotype um what's going to be the differential well from a medicine standpoint it's going to be someone who has a con syndrome you know con syndrome is not common <laughs> and when we talk about con syndrome it's going to be you know an adrenal tumor just cranking out lots of aldosterone and of course you can check urine sodium and chloride why is the urine sodium going to be high once again what does this patient have metabolic alkalosis what is the proximal tubule going to do it's going to want to retain the what hydrogen Hydrogen is what? Positive. It kicks out the what? Sodium into the tubule. Sodium will be high in the urine. Why is the urine chloride going to be high in this case? Well, what did I just say earlier is that because you're secreting lots of aldosterone, aldosterone does what? It makes you dump out hydrogen and potassium in the urine. Both of those have what? Positive charges. So who's going to bind to the positive hydrogen ion and positive potassium? You got it. Chloride. So the urine chloride is also going to be high. So once again, I really spent a lot of time on this because I just know it's high yield for the boards. So I put this here because what was my bottom line point is that quite commonly when we talk about critical care boards, we always say, well, what's their volume status? Are they volume up, volume down? And one of the things that we always look at is urine sodium, right? And urine sodium for the most part is a good marker of intravascular volume, you know, the only time urine sodium is not helpful to determine intravascular volume if you have a what? Metabolic alkalosis. And why is it not going to be helpful? Because of that pesky pump. 
<laughs> what is that pump again? The sodium hydrogen pump. Because when you have a metabolic alkalosis, what do you want to do initially? Dump out the sodium. So what do we use instead as a surrogate marker for volume status in the setting of a metabolic alkalosis? You're in what? Chloride. And that is the take-home message. So, you know, let's do another one. 50-year-old woman is evaluated in the ED for a one-day history of, uh-oh, hearing voices. Um, history is significant for bipolar. And, okay, she's on lithium and she's on quetonapine. That's going to be Seroquel. Um, <laughs> I don't know about your ICU, but, my God, my fellows love handing out Seroquel like it's candy in the ICU. Um, <laughs> check that QT interval. Um, on exam, the patient is disheveled and looks chronically ill. She's alert and oriented, but appears anxious. All right. Blood pressure is 138 over 78. Heart rate is 80 without or orthostatic changes. There is no edema. The remainder of the exam is normal. And they give some lab studies. Don't worry. Everything is where? In the serum. So it's good. Oh! There's a little urine there. I take it back. I'm sorry. There's some urine in there. So, <laughs> um, BUN looks all right. Creatinine looks good. But uh oh, look at that sodium 126. It's low. Potassium is okay. So is the chloride. So is the bicarb. And glucose is okay too. And it looks like the urine sodium in this case is going to be, well, if for time's sake, I'm going to help you out a little bit. It looks to be what? High or low? It looks low. Uh, urine osmolarity seems to be what? High or low? Yeah, it seems pretty low. So you got a low urine sodium, a low urine osmolarity. And sodium is 126 in the serum. And she's coming in for hearing these voices. And she has bipolar. All right. And she's on lithium <laughs> and Seroquel. Okay. Um, which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's um, hyponatremia? Um Man, I really wish we could interact a little bit. I'm so excited. <laughs> so anyone, do we think the answer is hyperglycemia? Probably not, but for one reason, uh, seeing how the glucose is what? Normal, so I'll take that off. Um, what about what about nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? Does anyone want to pick that one? Probably not, because, you know, if you have nephrogenic, or if you have diabetes insipidus in general, that serum sodium is definitely not going to be what low it's definitely not going to be low it makes no sense so it's not going to be b and why did he put this here probably because of that lithium you know so it really comes down to psychogenic polydipsia i don't know when's the last time i answered that on the boards um sadh all right or she volume down so how are you going to decide what is the right answer here you know yeah I mean, you guys know and gals know me so well now. It's all about the what? The urine. So if you haven't noticed the theme here, I know every one of you are going to get the serum stuff, boom, like that. It's all about the urine. So what was one of the choices? It was SIADH. I don't think she's at risk for SIADH. You know, there's no something in the CNS. There's no lung cancer. There's no pneumonia over there. And if you had SIADH, everyone, what would the urine, sodium, and urine osmolarity be? Just yell it out. Okay, I can't hear you, <laughs> but the urine sodium in SADH should be high. The urine osmolarity in SADH should be what? High. So, I mean, just by default, it can't be this based on lab studies. Um, volume depletion. All right, all right. Uh, if your volume down, the urine sodium needs to be what? Low. All right. This could be it. I mean, I don't know. Your insulin is very low. And the last one was someone who has psychogenic polydipsia, like chugging, 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 chugging water. So if you're chugging lots of water. What would your urine sodium be? Well, it's going to be very dilute. So the urine sodium has to be what? Low. So it really comes down to, uh-oh, urine sodium is low in both. So how do I pick what is going to be the right answer if urine sodium is low for both polydipsia and, and being volume down. Ah, you got it. What's the thing you have to look at next? It's going to be the urine osmolarity. So urine osmolarity, we don't think about it that often. We don't really sometimes don't realize why it's going to be important. So if you have, you're going to be dehydrated, what would the urine osmolarity be? High. 
Well, if you have this psychogenic polydipsy or chugging lots of water, it's going to be a very dilute urine. So urine sodium is going to be what? Low. And the urine osmolarity is also going to be low. So the answer is going to be what? Polydipsia. All right. So, <clears throat> and for the boards, you know what I mean? Maybe they're not going to make it, hey, someone's just drinking tons of water. Nina, I'm sure I work in the county hospital sometimes, and sometimes we have people that have beer potomania. So um, I think that'd be a fair question for the board exam. Someone comes in and trust me, they're not drinking the air quote good beer. I think they're drinking, what is that watered down beer that people drink? I, I forget. It's like, what, Keystone? Cores, Paps Blue Ribbon. I don't know. I'm sure you, you guys are coming up with some other ones. But if you're drinking lots of beer, it's called beer potomania, very similar to psychogenic polydipsia when you look at the urine. Okay. And I put tea and toast here because many of us have old, you know, patients who starting to get demented. They don't have good caretakers and they get something called tea and toast syndrome, but they'll have more of a normal urine osmolarity in these cases. So let's do one more. And then maybe we could do a little bit of teaching about sodium. How's that sound? Sound good? Okay. So 18 year old woman is brought to the ER by friends. Um, she is confused. She is febrile. And her friends state that she took some ecstasy at a party, but she was previously well with no past medical history. So stop right there. So why am I bringing ecstasy in here. So you know and I know on the critical care boards, they love toxicology. They love talking about, you know, whether it be PCP or cocaine or something like that or toxic alcohol. So definitely ecstasy is fair game for the board exams. All right. So took some ecstasy, comes in confused and febrile. On exam, patient's definitely confused. She's only oriented to her name. <clears throat> She is beyond febrile, 102. Her blood pressure is 148 over 94. She's tacky, to give at 20, O2 sats, 96%. And she's on two liters of nasal cannula. The remainder of the exam is unremarkable. And of course, we're gonna get some labs and it looks like her B1 creatinine are okay. Uh-oh, stop right there. Check out that urine sodium. That urine sodium is definitely what? Low, 118. Then potassium chloride, not too bad. Bicarb starting to edge down on the uh, uh, acidotic side and to give a urine osmolarity and contrary to this last urine osmolarity right here which was low this one looks pretty what yeah this one looks pretty high you have a high urine osmolarity so sodium is 118 she's only 18 years of age she took ecstasy uh which of the following is the most appropriate initial treatment. So classic critical care question, what do you want to do with this 18 year old person? So do you want to do a normal saline bolus at 100 mLs per hour? Do you want to give a little hypertonic 3% saline? You have a 100 mL bolus. Uh, should we do some fluid restriction? Uh, do you want to use a VAPTAN. These are vasopressin 2 receptor antagonists. Got the FDA approval for people with SADH. Or oral urea. Uh, that, and I'm going to tell you something for time's sake. That will be the wrong answer on the board exams. We don't use oral urea to, to help correct um, hyponatremia. So the answer here is going to be this patient is symptomatic. It's acute hyponatremia in the symptomatic realm that, sure, it's always nice to know what etiology is, but this question talks about how do you treat her. And when you have symptomatic hyponatremia, acute mental status changes, acute neurological symptoms, you got to give what? Say it. Hypertonic. So the answer here is going to be what? B. But why am I talking about this is because what really dropped this 18 year old sodium so fast? It's about ecstasy. So when we talk about ecstasy, you can definitely get fatal hyponatremia, which is why it's gonna be on your board exams. And how do these patients become hyponatremic? In two ways. Number one, when you take ecstasy, it really just makes you super, super thirsty. I think when you watch these movies that people are just drinking a ton over there. So you're taking in lots and lots and lots of fluids, but at the same time, you develop what? This SIADH type syndrome where you have antidiuretic hormone, inappropriate secretion of antidiuresis. So if you're not, if you're retaining the fluid and you're drinking fluid, uh-oh, your sodium is really gonna what? 
drop. And you know what's scary about this is that this can occur, this drop in sodium, regardless of how much you took. So this is going to be a triple star high yield pearl for the board exams. So with that being said, what I wanted to do, you know, and I apologize that I went over here, is I'm all about making these little charts to help you get all the right answer on the boards. So just like I did for metabolic alkalosis, here's how I work up hyponatremia, really focusing on the question itself. So once you're hyponatremic, what should you do? You could calculate or order serum osmolarity, right? Calculating serum osmolarity is two times the sodium plus the BUN divided by 2.8 plus the glucose divided by 18, or you can measure it. And why do you sometimes want to calculate and measure it? Well, if you want to calculate the osmolar gap. And you and I know when they're going to ask about osmolar gap, when they give you a toxic alcohol, something like ethylene glycol, something like methanol, always think about that osmolar gap. So once you calculate serum osmolarity, you know, you could bring into three main categories, hypoosmolar, iso, and hyperosmolar. So from the hyperosmolar, you know, that seems weird. How can you be hyponatremic, but hyperosmolar? Odd. So one of the things that can do that is being hyperglycemic, you know, and of course, the other thing could be on medications such as mannitol. So if you're doing neurocritical care, maybe someone comes in with increased intracranial pressure. And of course, mannitol is an osmotic diuretic. It's osmotically active. And if you're giving mannitol and you measure serum osmolarity, it's definitely going to be what? High. You can't calculate it. But if you measure it and you're giving mannitol, it's definitely going to be high. You know, uh, and why does hyperglycemia make you hyponatremic? Well, it's all about that fluid, right? Shifting into the vessel, out of the cell, into the vessel, really diluting that sodium. Well, over here, if you're isoosmolar, remember everyone that that's kind of weird. How can you be hyponatremic but be isoosmolar, you know? And this one really doesn't make a lot of sense in the year 2022. Why? Is because this is more of a, a measuring error that in the olden days, we wanted to measure, you know, uh, serum sodium. If you had high levels of proteins or high levels of lipids that, remember everyone, proteins and lipids, most of them have what charge? Negative. If you have lots of protein, like in multiple myeloma, you know, Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia, you know, amyloidosis, you have lots of protein, it's going to kind of bind to that sodium. So when you measure it, it's going to be falsely low. Same thing with lipids. I mean, they're called lipoproteins. They kind of have a, a negative charge. Same concept right there. So, you know, when we talk about hyperosmolar and isoosmolar or hyponatremia, that it's really those two together are kind of like pseudo hyponatremia. Really, if you're going to be hyponatremic by definition, you got to be what? Hypoosmolar. Let's look at that serum osmolarity. It's two times the sodium. So if you're truly hyponatremic, you got to be hypoosmolar. And once we know you're in this category, how do I work up the question in my mind at least? I look at two things. Volume status, which is very what? Subjective, you know. But then to be objective, I love to look at the urine sodium. And in this question, we talked about urine osmolarity. So we're going to do both together. So based on subjective volume status, hypovolemic, hypervolemic, and euvolemic, right? And so hypovolemic, not a good answer on the board exams because to be hyponatremic, you really got to lose hypertonic fluid, which isn't really, not really clinically relevant. You know, we don't really lose hypertonic fluid, but because um, you're going to be a uh, a loss of volume because you're going to say this patient's going to be dehydrated. Well, you can imagine urine sodium is going to be low. If you're going to be hypervolemic, well, what's going to give you hypervolemia in physical examination? Problem with oncotic pressure or hydrostatic pressure. So who's going to be the main culprits? The heart, the liver, and the kidney. Most common question is what? CHF on your boards. Trust me. And if you have really bad CHF, everyone, is being hyponatremic, a bad prognostic indicator for heart failure, the answer is what? Yes, they'll love to throw that in the critical care boards. And of course, why do these patients with CHF become hyponatremic? Well, it's all because of the fact that when their volume down, when blood is going back to the right atrium, 
there are literally things called stretch receptors in the right atrium. And what happens is these stretch receptors actually will sense you being volume down, they'll influence the secretion of ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So ADH is strongly influenced by what? Serum osmolarity, but also influenced by volume status. And trust me, people with CHF do not need more ADH. So you get that secretion of antidiuretic hormone. What happens to sodium? It dilutes. So your heart has to be pretty bad for you to cause your body to secrete ADH based on volume status. So what happens in these cases when you check urine sodium? Because in the vessel, your volume what? Down, urine sodium is going to be low. Euvolemic, there's a very broad differential diagnosis here. And you know, I don't have the time to go through each one, but you know, and I know what's going to be the question on your boards. It's going to be SIADH, right? We already talked about psychogenic polydipsia. We talked about <clears throat> people who come in and ecstasy, which is going to be one of the things I think about on the boards, but SIADH. And if you're going to have SIADH, we already said urine sodium is going to be high. Urine osmolarity is going to be high. Of course, treat the underlying cause. Of course, think about fluid restriction. Of course, in some cases, you can think about tolvaptan and conivaptan. And urine sodium, as I mentioned, is going to be higher in this place. When is urine osmolarity going to be a deal breaker? It helps determine who has someone who has volume down being dehydrated with a low urine sodium versus someone who has psychogenic polydipsia or beer potomania, where urine sodium is going to be low also, but urine osmolarity is going to be the deal breaker. Low in uh, beer potomania and polydipsia, high when you're going to be dehydrated. 68-year-old man was intubated four days ago, endotracheally intubated four days ago for respiratory failure due to pneumonia. All right. So there was a 7.5 ET tube was inserted during a difficult intubation. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the patient remains on the ventilator and has had intermittent agitation despite doing sedation and analgesia. Today, <clears throat> a spontaneous cuff leak is audible. So the respiratory therapist has inflated the cuff twice earlier today. And of course, it resulted temporarily in elimination of the leak and then there was this concern was raised about, hey, maybe the balloon surrounding the ET tube was uh, torn. So they got chest x-ray to see where you are, and there is a chest x-ray. And, you know, I would say for time's sake, I'm not going to make you scrutinize it. And this is classic x-ray. There's so many lines and ECG wires and central line. But where is that ET tube? I think it's going to be right here with the arrow. So there's the ET tube and in and, and class learners. Is the ET tube in a good position? No, probably not, right? I think if you have to memorize it out, we want the ET tube to be what? Right, two to five centimeters above the carina. If you're in rounds with me, if you ask me what anatomical structure do I use to see if the ET tube is at the right area? I know many of you are going to yell out clavicles, clavicles. But the answer for me at least is, you know, the clavicles tend to move. Why? Because if you're a lordotic, that it kind of rotates a little bit. But you know what really doesn't move is the aortic knob. And I like to use the aortic knob for me to be kind of where I like to see the tip of the ET tube. But regardless, I mean, this ET tube is going to be what? High. Um, which is the best approach in managing this very high ET tube. So do you want to add air to the ET tube cuff and control the agitation a little more effectively? So, you know, nail this patient with more what? Propofol, crank up the what? The Presidex. Okay, let's add some more Versed. Or what is probably the most common thing my fellows have been ordering all the time for sedation? Probably ketamine. I don't know if you guys are the same way that you've been using a lot more ketamine now. They're always trying to convince me. <coughs> well, Dr. Raj, they're hypotensive. You know, let's use some ketamine instead. And next thing you know, they have like three drips going on. Okay. So um, add air, control the agitation. Uh, B, deflate the ET tube. Oh, and just advance it. A little blinded. All right. Uh, C, exchange the ET tube for a new ET tube with an intact cuff, oh, using something called an airway exchange catheter. You know, probably my fellows would pick this. They haven't been certified in it just to get some practice, you know. <laughs> um, or D, examine the ET tube and the airway 
with a flexible bronc. And nowadays we have all these portable broncs in the ICU. And then with the bronchoscope in the ET tube, you can advance the ET tube over the scope. I mean, these are all tempting. And I'm sure in your practice, everyone's going to pick something different. I know someone out there is going to pick B. Just push it in, you know. But for, <laughs> but for the board exams, what's going to be the right answer? Can you yell it out? Yeah, it's going to be D, right? You want to be safe. You want to put the scope in there, look at the airway, and kind of slide the ET tube over the scope or use a new ET tube and advance it over there. So, you know, in this case, cuff leak, how common is that? You know what I mean? I put a manometer right here, which, you know, if you want to check exactly how much pressure is going to be um, uh, uh, in the cuff, and this is going to be your pilot balloon over here. And of course, you know, I took a little picture of here about using that flexible bronchoscope, really examining the airway and, you know, doing that fiber optic intubation with it. Um, so when we talk about this question, very, very common, you know what I mean? Many as 10% of tracheal intubated patients develop air loss around the ET tube, you know, and sometimes you can hear it, you know what I mean? And I put a little picture of the ET tubes that we use and right here at the end of it, there's this thing called the Murphy's eye. And so actually, you know, one of my first years asked me, hey, I mean, why do we have the Murphy's eye? And that's a great question. So, you know, it's called the Murphy's eye, I mean, mainly because it's a protective thing that let's say the tip of the ET tube, the bevel actually gets occluded with mucus, tumor, or blood, whatever you're sucking out, you know what I mean? Then there's no way you can ventilate these patients. So as a protection, we have this Murphy's eye, which is gonna be through the side. So it's kind of a protective thing. So when we talk about the other answers on the, on the question, well, number one, there was something called using an airway exchange catheter. And I really wanted to talk about this for a second. So <clears throat> when we talk about an airway exchange catheter and doing the procedure, where what happens is, is you, take this long flexible tube and there's, it's called an airway exchange catheter. The other thing is a bougie and a bougie and an airway exchange catheter is not the same thing. What's the main difference is that an airway exchange catheter ha is hollow on the inside. So you could actually connect that to a ventilator and ventilate the patient using an airway exchange catheter. A bougie is just a bougie, you know what I mean? There's nothing, you can't ventilate the patient with it. But essentially what you're gonna do is put this catheter, you know, through the ET tube, take out the old ET tube and put a new one in. And for those of you who have done this before, I mean, is that pretty easy? At least for me, not. You got to sedate the patient, maybe paralyze the patient. Sometimes it's actually more troublesome than just reintubating the patient to begin with. But you know, I mean, it's not wrong to do it. You know, it's definitely wanted to mention that. But, you know, in this case, the, the nice, the safest right way to do things is to put the bronchoscope in there. So I wanted to mention that. Um, and of course, you know, positioning of the tube, you know, when we do look at x-rays in the morning, you know, one of my little pet peeves about ET tube is always going to be the hose follows the nose. So you want to look at the position of the patient. So if the patient's looking up, ET tube is going to be up. The hose follows the nose. If the patient's flex downward, then the ET tube will be falsely down. So you always want to think about rotation and the, and the position of the patient's neck. So with this being said, let me do one more. I know I said I wouldn't do it, but we're so close. Let me do one more, then we'll call the day. 25-year-old um, female is evaluated in the ER for increasing shortness of breath. After a bee sting, she feels lightheaded, describes a sense of swelling in her face, on exam, afebrile, hypotensive, tacky, tachypneic, super agitated, Diffuse wheezing is noted on lung auscultation, but no strider, no evidence of facial or tongue swelling, and there's no rash. <clears throat> Which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? So this patient, classic, is going to be bee sting, and yeah, say it. She's in probably a distributive shock. Which one? Say it. Anaphylaxis. So are they going to ask you anaphylactic shock on your critical care boards? Yes. It's life threatening. They definitely will ask you this. So, which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? So, is it A, you want to intubate and ventilate, mechanically ventilate this patient? B, I am epi and give a little albuterol. C, IV diphenhydramine and some steroids. D, uh, intravenous epi, go for it. 
and while you're there in the vein, uh, methylprednisone, steroids, and give some diphenhydramine. So I love this question for the boards because, you know, sometimes, you know, the right answer is not what you see people doing. The right answer is what we don't do that often, you know what I mean? Or maybe opposite of what people are doing. So the answer here is going to be, yeah, B. All this patient needs is some ion epi that you can give immediately. Time is of the essence. And why did I bring this up here is because people are, are going to ask me, about, what about those steroids? What about the antihistamines? Why can't we give those to the patient? So let's talk about this. So when we talk about anaphylactic shock, you know what I mean? It's definitely you're going to think about IM or sub-Q, IM being the route to give it, give to these patients. You know, when we talk about antihistamines and steroids, I mean, the truth is they have not been shown to improve outcomes in anaphylaxis. And they really are not going to work that well. You know I mean, let's be honest. You know what I mean? I mean, sure, someone could argue during our, our conversation, what about this bimodal delayed anaphylaxis? Sure, we could always argue about that. But in this acute setting for this vignette, for this patient right here, what's the thing you need to do? Yeah, it's I am epi. There's no questions asked. That's what's going to save this patient's life. And I mean it. So when we talk about anaphylaxis in general, I mean, Sirius is downplaying, you know, the, you know, how anaphylaxis is life-threatening. You may die from it. Symptoms, you know, rash. If someone asks me, what is the most common organ affected when you have anaphylaxis? Skin. It's got to be the skin. You look for that rash. Of course, you can get throat swelling and low blood pressure, causes insect, insect stings, foods, definitely medications. And, you know, when does it typically start? Well, I mean, it could be as quick as five minutes or immediately, sometimes a little delayed. And I mentioned already organs are going to be involved, skin, lungs, GI tract, cardiovascular. So when we talk about some of the pathophysiology, I'm kind of really summarizing it. Anaphylaxis is immunologic. You know, we talk about IgE bindings to the antigen that activates mast cells and basophils, releases of inflammatory mediators such as histamine. And there's something called anaphylactoid, which we don't use that term anymore. So I want to be honest, we don't use the term anaphylactoid. Right here, the World Allergy Organization prefers the new name, which is non-immunologic anaphylaxis. All right, I want to make sure I say it, okay? And the big thing about this is that you're not using IgE. It's Ig independent. So terminology, anaphylactic shock. Already, these are going to be individuals that have the low blood pressure, not responding to IV fluids. Biphasic, I mentioned there could be a second peak that, her, that happens sometimes, not as common. And we don't use the terminology anaphylactoid. It's non-immune anaphylaxis, but it's not an allergic reaction, but it's due to whatever it is, such as a contrast agent, directly um, degranulating mast cells, but not through IgE. So, you know, when you want to make the diagnosis, it's definitely a clinical diagnosis. You want to actually treat these patients in a very, very timely fashion. You know, you definitely want to look for the trigger if possible. You look for the clinical presentation. And of course, someone's going to say, well, what about blood tests? I mean, sure, if you can get tryptase and histamine, you're in the hospital, you have the blood vials there, it's not a problem. But most often, they're not readily available. And when we talk about how should you give the epi? The quickest way to give it is always going to be IM as soon as the diagnosis is suspected and repeat it. You may repeat the IM epi in five minutes and 15 minutes if there's no response. In theory, people on beta blockers may be not responsive to epi. On a board exam, they love glucagon, though not many people have glucagon available to them. And of course, the wrong way to give epi is the way it was given in Pulp Fiction. We don't want to give it directly into the heart. Um, so why we use epinephrine? It activates alpha-1, vasoconstricts. It could activate beta-1, so it increases the heart contraction. Activates beta-2, it could be a bronco what? Dilator. So that's why epi is going to be the drug of choice. You know, we mentioned uh, H1 and H2 blockers. You're not going to hurt the patient by giving, but there's just limited evidence, and it's not going to help the patient right away. Steroids are probably not going to hurt the patient, but they're just not going to work in the acute setting. You know, no downside in giving nebulized albuterol. And I put this here to be complete. Sometimes someone's going to convince me in the ICU when we have a refractory shock. Do you want to give methylene blue? And yes, everyone, that's the same methylene blue. That's the antidote for hemoglobinemia. Someone's going to ask me, how does it work? It inhibits nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is going to be a very potent vasodilator. So 
please don't answer this for the board exams. <laughs> Just give I am Epi. And what is going to be really my take home message here is my bottom line point. And I'm just going to read these because they're so important. You know, patients with anaphylaxis should be assessed and treated as rapidly as possible for respiratory and cardiac arrest, and death could happen in what? Minutes. And that's why give it IM. Don't wait for the IB to get started. Anaphylaxis appears to be most responsive if you hit it in the early phase. That's why the minute, like, you're writing your note and you think the shock could even possibly be anaphylaxis, you need to treat. And so, I mean, before, and if you could give the epi before shock has developed, that's when you have the better outcomes. And really, there are no absolute contraindications to give epinephrine. You know, and it is the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis. And even, and I put this in the last part here, even if they only have a few hives or some mild wheezing on the boards in clinical practice, give the epinephrine, give the epinephrine. So of course, for patients who are not profoundly hypotensive or in shock, yes, I am epi is just the quickest way to do it. Where do I give it? Mid outer thigh, not <laughs> intracardiac. So with that being said, I, you know, I actually told the people at, you know, the past machine, I wasn't gonna go till 5.30. My voice is going to get tired. I'm going to be pooped. But look at the time, everyone. It's 5.30. I really, really hope you enjoyed this. I try to give everything I had. I hope this helps for your board exams. And um, hey, um, hey, maybe you can meet soon one day. And the last thing I'll say is if you have any questions or comments, hey, follow me on Instagram. I know you're going to laugh at me, but it's the best way to get a hold of me when we talk about things. I have two podcasts out there. Beyond the Pearls podcast is all medical pearls. There's also a Dr. Raj podcast. So if you like this tonight, hey, text me on Instagram and tell me how much you liked it. And thank you very much. I hope you enjoy my books. A uh, couple of other things. Uh, neurogenic shock after IV fluids, what pressure should be used. Yeah, and so number one, I like what we're talking about. If you're gonna have neurogenic shock, it's gonna be cervical, right? Why is it gonna be cervical when you have the damage? Because of the sympathetic ganglion. So when you sever the sympathetic ganglion, you're gonna have what? no sympathetic tone. You're going to be hypotensive. You're going to have overwhelming what? Parasympathetic. You're going to be bradycardic. So, you know, it's really not a, a, you know, which presser is going to be the one that you want, but I would have something that addresses the bradycardia as well as the hypotension. So sometimes, you know, I tend to gravitate a little more towards norepinephrine, sometimes epinephrine, but it really depends. You know what I mean? So you want to have addressed the bradycardia and the hypotension. Great answer. Um, colorectal hollis viscous in oh, this uh, post repair duration of IV antibiotics, 24 hours versus 40 days or four days. Well, you know, the answer is what bug did you grow? And how bad was the injury? So there's so many different things that we need to factor in there. Is the patient bacteremic or not? You know what I mean? So I don't want to say that there's a one set answer over here. It really depends on many things put together, but great question. Cinnamonal pneumonia, HAPVAP, current duration is seven days, antibiotics are 14. You know, once again, um, usually it's going to be seven days. It depends on different antibiotics. You know what I mean? Some antibiotics got the approval for 10 days. Some got it for 14 days. For the board exams, seven day course is going to be the answer. Procalcitonin implications, really going to be the answer for bacterial, bacterial, bacterial pneumonias. You know what I mean? It's going to be something that helps out when you think about VAPs, but it's so hard to distinguish a VAP, especially if someone comes in, it's immunocompromised, a transplant patient, high dose steroids, you worry about fungus, worry about PCP. Procalcitonin is not going to be as good, but on the board exams, if they give it to you, when are these procalcitonins going to be helpful? Not when they're positive, but definitely when they're negative. They definitely have a very high negative predictive value. You know what I mean? Um, multi-vessel cabbage, dual antiplatelet therapy versus aspirinoli, very spicy question. It really depends on risks and benefits, risk of bleeding, you know what I mean? But definitely that's a going to be a very, very hot topic right now. Um, glutamine versus arginine in the ICU, any role still in 2022? Unfortunately, not as much, you know what I mean? And definitely not on the board exams as of right now. Young man, isolated refractory hyperkalemia, intermittent HD. What do we do? Well, once again, what is the bigger picture here? You know what I mean? Can the young man tolerate HD? You're going to have big shifts in blood pressure, big shifts in fluids. You know, if the patients can be very symptomatic from the hyperkalemia before doing these things or while doing these things, what are you going to do? Protect one thing, the heart. How are you going to do that? Insulin, glucose. What can you do? 
you know, maybe give some bicarb if they're going to be, you know, acidemic, help out with the bicarb. I mean, so really it depends. Um, can the patient tolerate it? Do they have access? Are they hypotensive? But of course, you want to do things first to actually protect the heart. And of course, calcium gluconate, calcium chloride, protect the heart. And of course, giving the insulin and glucose, shoving that potassium wire inside the cell. Um, 12 year old after lap appendectomy, oh, died. Immediately post op, oh, oh. I mean, it's just a statement. Uh, I mean, either or, it just makes me sad. You know, anything that's 12 year old, true story. Uh, I don't think we're going to know what the answer is over there. But um, I think that's all of them. Is there more? Oh my God. Uh, if the urine anion gap is negative from the gut, yeah. Yes, correct. Thank you, Michael, for the nice statement. Can you talk about how you might use the delta gap? Well, you know, the delta gap really quickly, Don, is when we talk about a triple acid base disorder. You know, and when do we think about that? When you have a metabolic acidosis. And anytime you have any acid base disorder, you always calculate the anion gap. If you have an anion gap, you need to calculate something called a delta gap. And I also will evaluate something in my opinion called a starting bicarb to see if there's gonna be a triple acid base disorder. And that's right. In the critical care boards, go figure. You could have a triple acid base disorder. You could have individuals that could have both a gap and non-gap metabolic acidosis at the same time. And that's where I think about the delta gap. All right. I think we're pretty good. 